the task of whitewashing her fans. As you already know, the Tom points out that it is not exactly work if he is enjoying himself and he makes a great show of applying the whitewash as an attractive and interesting work to the boys in town. By middle of the afternoon, the fence is whitewashed by the other boys, of course. What is your true motive or mission? How do your family, friends, recognize and evaluate your mission service? Do they want to follow or imitate your lifestyle? Since the early church, there has been a tendency to take one specific biblical verse as a missionary text. During the Enlightenment, the mission was very diverse and more multifaceted than ever before. The several missionary texts can be identified among these. The most widely used text during the entire period is the Great Commission of Matthew 28. So during the Enlightenment, the, the Great Commission was a prominent uh, text for the missionary motive. Since the middle of the 18th century to the early half of the 20th century, several motives had blended together to form a missionary idea. I want to talk more about the co-relationship between the Great Commission and eschatology. Although the Great Commission featured during the Reformation and the Protestant Orthodoxy, the person that could really uh, be credited with the putting it on the map was William Kelly in his 1792 tract entitled An Inquiry. Since Kelly, the appeal to Matthew 28 has always been prominent in Protestant missions. In the United States, it has become the major motive for engaging in mission after 1810. During the second half of the 19th century, several mission leaders and mission organizations began to use Matthew 24, 14 as the major missionary text. German missionary J. Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission, was motivated by these eschatological expectations and campaigned for the evangelization of China's missions in great haste before Christ returned. In the same period, based on Daniel 8.14, Adventists believed that they were the people of prophecy. Their mission task was tied with their consciousness of the people of prophecy. They believed that they had a role to play in salvation history as a prophetic movement preparing mankind for the second advent of Christ. With a self-consciousness as a remnant in Revelation 20, 12, 17, they identified themselves as a flying angels in Revelation 14 and 18. After the great disappointment, Adventists employed Revelation 10, 11 as their eschatological prophetic responsibility. From the late 1870s, the three angels' message came to be associated with the Matthew 24, 14. When they realized that his coming could not take place at any moment before the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the, all the world for a witness unto all nations, their missionary consciousness could be gradually developed to a concept of a worldwide mission responsibility. Furthermore, since the first official essay overseas missionary, J.N. Andrews, sailed for Europe in 17. 1874, the third angel's message began to be associated with the Gospel Commission of Matthew 28. Especially, is why connects the Great Commission as the mission of the remnant church. In the end of the 20th century, Russell Brill successfully explained the core relationship between Matthew 24, 14, 28, 19 and Revelation 14, 6 through 12, emphasizing the disciple making. He says, while Matthew 24, 14 has given us our commission, Revelation 14, 6 to 12 has given us our message to fulfill that commission. 
And the last sentence, Matthew 24, 14, cannot be isolated from the goal of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, making disciples. Furthermore, Russell Bree explains the core relationship between the Great Commission and the Three Angels' message. The beauty of the Three Angels' message passage in Revelation 14 is that it brings together as a composite whole all the elements of the two texts in Matthew. And he mentioned the core relationship, the, the, uh, the worldwide proclamation, the object, and the urgency. So the, to compare the continuity between the Great Commission and the Three Angels message, I prepare some chart. First, both of them are based on the authority of Jesus Christ. Both of them have the same goal, making obedient disciples and the same range of spread. The content of the messages are the same. Both of them also mention eschaton and mission and contain the message of judgment. And for the achievement of the commission, both of them need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. While we will well understand this continual missional consciousness, we need to be conscious of a deadly myth among Adventists. Since the focus of Adventism mission has been upon the fulfillment of the three angels' message, we have had a tendency to see even this text as a primarily proclamational. As a result, we have concentrated on giving a cognitive message to the world which they either accept or reject. Instead, we must always reflect the goal and focus of our mission. We need to emphasize disciple-making in the process of evangelism. Quoted, giving the message is not the goal of our mission. The focus of our mission is making disciples who are ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Revelation 14 must be seen as an extension of John's con commentary on the Great Commission as it is to be carried out in the last days of human history. The goal of the Three Angels' message is identical to the goal of the Great Commission, the making of disciples who keep the commandments of God and remain faithful to Jesus. Such a people are spiritually developed, mature Christian disciples who are in the fullest ready to meet Jesus when he returns. Ezwai says, every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. Abraham Lalu, the first missionary in Asia, was baptized in 1873 by Elder John Lapabro at Windsor Camp Meeting of North California when he was 51 years old. Five years later, in 1877, he converted his neighbor, W.C. Granger, at Anderson Valley. Then, Abraham Laru, as a self-supporting missionary, went to Hong Kong in 1888. After his baptism, W.C. Granger, Granger was appointed as the second president of Pacific Union College. In 1893, he went to Japan as the first Adventist missionary. In his first baptism in Japan in 19, uh, 1899, he baptized four Japanese. Among them was Pastor Kunia Hide. While visiting Japan, two Koreans, Son Hung Jo and Yi Hung Jun, converted to Seventh day Adventism in 1904 through the influence of the evangelist Kunia Hide. On the ship that Elder Son took back to Korea, he in turn converted Im Kiban. Once arriving in Korea, these two men aroused interesting Adventism among Korean Christians. Four months later, with the support of Pastor Kunia Hide and the FW Field, President of Japan Mission, they were able to organize the first Korean assembly in September 27, 
1904. It was only four months later after Elder Son's baptism. Afterward, the Japan mission sent a letter to GC to send a new missionary to Korea in 1905. Only one and a half months later, the first missionary arrived in Korea. It was W.R. Smith. In 1909, missionary Smith was sent to Wonsan, the northeast coast of Korea, to plant new churches. At the end of the year, he baptized Choi Taehyun, who later became the first native president of Korean mission and was later martyred by the Japanese imperial authority. In 1929, Elder Choi Taehyun baptized Ho Man Sik, who was later appointed as the first Southwest Korean mission president. In 1949, Elder Homan-sik visited a rural house in the southern part of Korea for evangelism. In the family, there was a high school student. Pastor Ho encouraged him to transfer to the SDA Academy in Seoul. The boy was baptized there in October 18, 1951 by Pastor Ho. Later, he became a Eastern Central Korean Conference President. As you imagine, he's my father, Elder Kim Jin Young. On the day he was ordained, he prayed, Lord, let me baptize 1,000 souls during my whole ministry. Until now, he baptized 1,200 souls. While I was preparing this sermon, I asked my father, do you recognize your spiritual genealogy? Can you imagine how was he reacted? My father baptized me when I was 12 years old. I have followed my father's way of ministry. Several years ago, one lady visited my office and said, Pastor, I am your fifth descendant. I baptized a university girl in a local church and she converted her friends and this keep going and this, this spiritual genealogy went down to fifth. There is a strong New Testament evidence that baptism carries a symbol of ordination to the ministry of all believers. One who is baptized must be prepared to enter the ministry which Jesus commissioned to go and make disciples. I call it building spiritual genealogy. Such as God command, God's commandments be fruitful and multiply in first blessing of Genesis 1, the endless spiritual multiplying genealogy making disciples is a promise and blessing as well as commandment. Quotation, every Christian should grow up to the maturity of discipleship and then reproduce other disciples. Every disciple should be a spiritual parents for other growing disciples, then a grandparents, then a great grandparents. I strongly believe that the gospel will preach to the end of the world by the end of time multiplying disciples of Christ. There is another deadly myth among Adventists. That is an idea that when the later rain comes, we will be transformed and fitted for the eschatological mission service without any effort on their part. Many of our members, however, do not understand that the season between the early rain and the later rain is also a season of rain. That is the season of the Holy Spirit. If there is no rain between the early rain and the later rain, nothing can survive. Till the harvest season, the rain should continue to water the land. When the crops reach a certain stage of maturity, the later rain makes the harvest abundant. Thus, we need to emphasize that we should experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in our daily life in the days before the later rain falls. 
according to his w i f e This means that wherever we are, our daily ministry should be under the influence of the Holy Spirit unto the end. Only those who seek the presence of the Holy Spirit in their daily mission service will experience a revival by the later rain. In conclusion, I want to share one quotation. Every day, that passes bring us nearer the end. Does it bring us also nearer to God? Are we watching upon prayer those with whom we associate day by day need our help, our guidance? They may be in such a condition of mind that a world in season will be sent home by the Holy Spirit as a nail in a sure place. Laborers are needed who comprehend the greatness of the work and who will engage in it, not for the wages they receive, but from a realization of the nearness of the end. Thought time demands greater efficiency and deeper consecration. Let's pray. Loving, gracious Father in heaven, thank you for calling us as a remnant in the age of Eskaton and giving us commission to preach the everlasting gospel. In our daily disciple-making ministry, Lord, let us experience the presence of your Holy Spirit and the missionary revival through the end of time, multiplying disciples of Christ. We lay down all of our limits and weakness. Please bless our global church leaders to lead this church to follow your great commission, seeking the presence of the Holy Spirit. And make all of us testify more often all this were done by the Holy Spirit. Please be with us during the star trip in Rome today to be safe and meaningful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.